thank you very much to um, Professor Griffith for helping me in parts of this book when I was trying to find out about the legacy of Mrs. Gibson and Mrs. Lewis in Christian Arabic letters and indeed for himself and for the Department of Semitic and Egyptian Language and Literature to give its full title another bounce today for the invitation and to all of you. Uh, I, I read a little bit on the website about the foundation of the, of the uh, department and uh, found out that it was started very much at the time when my two ladies were traveling and indeed when this photograph was taken, this photograph by the way is a Dominican photograph I have to say from the Echo Biblique and if you could zoom in you would probably see that those men in pith helmets are also wearing Dominican habits because they are approaching the holy mountains of Sinai in one of their early expeditions uh, from the Echo Biblique in Jerusalem. But my story begins in Cambridge, where, as you've heard, I'm a professor. And these gates, which I often cycle past, um, it is the gates of Westminster College, which was the Presbyterian. In Cambridge, we have a consortium of theological colleges attached to the university. There's a couple of Episcopal ones, Anglican, there's a, um, a Methodist one. And this was founded as the Presbyterian College. And um, you see over the gates this splendid emblem of the burning bush and the motto chosen by its lady foundresses for the college, Nec Tamen Consumabator, and it was not consumed, referring of course to the bush uh, from which God spoke to Moses which burnt and was not consumed. And you may see another allusion, a visual allusion to the lady foundresses in the fact that there's an obelisk in the forecourt here. Well, who were these ladies? Um, Agnes and Margaret Smith were born in 1843 in a small coastal town of Irvine, south of Glasgow. And this is Irvine at about the time when they were born, a rather dull, quiet sort of place. Their mother died giving birth to them, uh, probably of, of infection after the birth. And their father, who was a lawyer, decided to raise them up himself. He was a self-made man. He Scotland's educational system had enabled him to get scholarships and go from being uh, from a poor village background and go to law school, and he was a lawyer, and fairly prosperous. Um, this was the house uh, that he had built and was living in at the time of his marriage. Sadly, his wife died a year later when their first and only children were born. And he brought his daughters up himself. It's a curious thing that he never once spoke to them of their mother. They knew nothing about their mother, and as far as they knew, they had no other family in the world but their father. Um, neither of uh, their mother and father had any siblings. And so they really had alone with their father in the world. Um, but he had um, uh, a distant kinsman in the town for whom he did legal work, another John. They're all called John or Smith or something. It's a bit confusing. John Ferguson. And uh, this man, uh, a few would have known, this man was to inherit one of the very largest fortunes that was ever to go through the Scottish courts. Uh, this Ferguson had four uncles who go off. The, their father was a, a, a meadow farmer uh, and a skinflint by all accounts. And all four of his sons went to America at about the time of the revolution. And all four made great fortunes. And uh, all four died intestate. So these fortunes made in America dropped <laughs> intestate will by or intestate lack of will through and all ended up on this one remaining nephew back in Irvine who ended up with a vast fortune and um, John Smith was his uh, man of law and when this fellow Ferguson died he left his lawyer and distant kinsman an immense fortune so John Smith went from being a merely prosperous man to a distinctly rich man this is um, Irvine a little bit later in, in the century you see, it's, it's not a one-horse town exactly, but it's a pretty quiet place. This is the first photograph I have of either of the twins. And this is Agnes. Uh, they were Agnes and Margaret when they are about 14. And that's about the time that their father came into this immense fortune. It didn't make a big deal of difference. He was, these were devout Presbyterians, and they didn't believe in, in show or ostentation or pride of blood, as Agnes would call it. But it made this difference, that their father had to go. He was the... He was the executor of the estate, and he had to go to the United States for a year to liquidate all Ferguson's assets. So he was away for a year, and Agnes and Margaret were sent to boarding school in Liverpool. And you can imagine this was quite a traumatic experience for them. They'd never 
been away from their father, their father was overseas. In those days, you could die on a transatlantic journey and difficult time for them. So here you think, I think Agnes looks rather as though she has the responsibility of the world on her shoulder. Um, and when um, he came back, he relocated the family. He um, he had been set up, uh, the, Ferguson had established a great um, charitable bequest in his name to be managed out of Glasgow. So their father moved the family to a tiny village called Kilbarkin uh, near Glasgow. Agnes and Margaret were sent on from their school when they were 18 um, on to um, finishing school in London. Now they were very highly educated for young ladies of their time uh, because most girls, uh, even in wealthy families, would be taken out of school at about 14 or 15. There's a lot of talk that too much education would steam a girl's mind and make her infertile, and you know all the stories. But he didn't believe that, and he also did something, I don't know whether by intention, but he, um, he made a deal with them when he found out they were good at languages, that for every language they learned, he'd take them to the country where that language was spoken. So as little girls, and with a twin as a constant practice partner, um, they learned uh, French and Spanish and German, and of course as a sort of a reward, they got this wonderful travel with their father, which they very much enjoyed. So they associated travel with being expanding and good. They were born in the 1840s, the decade in which they were born was the decade in which the railways expanded across Britain and then across Europe. So they were very much the early beneficiaries of steam uh, travel. Um, now, after they were, they went to this finishing school in London, and this, this must have been a very, again, a kind of trying experience for them. Why did their father, who was, by, by all I can figure out, a very modest man, he didn't worship in the Grand Church in Irvine, he went to a, shir, uh, uh, a church where most of the people were quite poor and so on, but I think that he realized that the fact that his daughters were going to be substantial heiresses would make a difference to their lives and he sent them to this school. But uh, I, my, my feeling that they resisted being finished in this way is one of the objects of these places would be to turn out young ladies asked from a copybook. And, and, and of course, one of that, the, the objects was to eradicate any regional accent. You had to emerge speaking as though you were Prince Charles from these, well, that's a little bit uh, anachronistic, but you know what I mean. And um, Agnes and Margaret, by all accounts, retained heavy, heavy local Ayrshire accents till the end of their lives. And as they were splendid linguists, I think there must have been an element of deliberation in this remaining rather rough-hewn. So back they went to this small town, which must have been absolutely deadly. Um, and uh, they were, in a sense, overqualified. They had too much money and too much education for both the context they were in and perhaps for their social background. Because snobbery, although the Scots like to think it doesn't exist in, in Scotland like it does in England, it, it, it does. And so they, weren't, they didn't have family in that sense to integrate with the landed family in the area. But on the other hand, they were too rich in a way to just marry a local farmer. It was a difficult patch. And perhaps if their father had lived, he might have introduced them to professors or lawyers in Glasgow who might have made ideal partners for his intelligent and well-educated daughters. But as it was, he died uh, when, when they were 22, uh, leaving them entirely alone uh, in the world, but as I have said, very rich. So what did they do? They decided to go down the Nile. Um, this was the 1860s, and it was before the days of organized Nile travel. And you, you know, they must have organized this trip from this tiny village while still in deep mourning with black rounded note paper, um, just from guidebooks, really, or the, the one guidebook, Murray's guidebook to, to Egypt, uh, which did give you useful advice on Nile travel, even down to what kind of claret is best drunk on the Nile. Um, and, uh, but they planned this trip, and you might say, isn't this a bit strange um, to go down the Nile when your, husband, your father is um, just recently deceased? But of course, in those days, um, the Nile was still the Holy Land. Uh, now we know the whole history of the pharaohs, we know about Ramses and the so on, but remember, Tutankhamun would only be discovered in the early 20th century. We know so much more about Egypt now than they did. And for most Western travelers, uh, and especially for Protestant travelers, the Nile was the land of the Bible. Uh, it's interesting that Protestant travelers had not traveled in any number to um, 
the, the Holy Land before. This was eschewed, it was frowned upon as being sort of, because Orthodox and, and Romans went to the Holy Land, um, Protestants were not venerators of places, and so they, they didn't go. But um, a new interest in history, the history of the Bible lands, and of course, steam travel made it possible um, to, to get there, um, and uh, after, after, certainly after the Napoleonic Wars were over. So Agnes and Margaret went, and there were two ways to, to get to Egypt, more than two ways, but the most obvious way would be to go across France from Marseille and to say, sail from Marseille to Alexandria or Suez. Um, but the most complicated and expensive and lengthy way was to go all the way across Europe to Budapest, to sail down the Danube to the Black Sea, to go to Constantinople, and then ricochet in little packet steamers across the eastern Mediterranean to Alexandria. And that is the way Agnes and Margaret met. Um, they obviously intended to make a real, if they were going to have a good trip, they were really going to do it. Now, the normal way in which uh, you would, Europeans would travel, well, British people would travel, even in continental Europe in those days, would be to hire um, a guide to go with you, a sort of mobile travel, travel agent, if you like, who would make all the arrangements, he would speak all the languages, and he would make your bookings for, for steam ships and for hotels and so on, a courier. Um, but Agnes and Margaret disdained couriers because clearly their father had done, and he, they said, if you spoke all the languages yourself, there was no need for a courier. So they didn't want one. Uh, they knew they had to take a chaperone. They were only 23. So they invited one of their former school mistresses from London. She was a Scottish woman like themselves. Uh, at 36, she wasn't an old lady exactly. She, in fact, she was quite young, but she was a school teacher. And so these three young women went off, as it were, just by themselves, all the way across Europe, Constantinople. Uh, to, to the Nile. Now this was really before organized Nile travel. Um, it was interested me when I was doing the research for my book that Agnes and Margaret actually went down the Nile at exactly the same time as the first Thomas Cook tour, the first organized trip. Uh, and it, it was, um, uh, but it was largely before organized travel. Several of the Thomas Cook passengers died on that voyage, so perhaps it was better that they hadn't, hadn't gone on it. Uh, but they, the, the way you really went down the Nile at this stage was to go to Cairo and then you had to hire a guide or dragoman as they were called. And the dragoman would hire a boat and a pilot, the crew, uh, he would provision the boat in the way that you uh, guided and so on. So they were convinced that they had um, the most perfect dragoman in the world. Uh, and uh, everything was all set for them to have this wonderful Nile trip. But it turned out that this dragoman, who everyone had praised at the time when they hired him, um, really took them for a ride. He really, he really, really cheated them um, by supplying things according to the letter of the law. So, say if they'd specified three bedrooms, there were three bedrooms, so they were minute with no closets, and, and uh, specified uh, a dinner of five courses, but one course would be sort of water or something like this. It was very... Um, very unsatisfactory. But worse than that, almost from their point of view, is he kept them almost in uh, as, as though they were in Perda while they were on this boat. He didn't, it, it transpired, he didn't want them to meet any other Western travelers because they would immediately compare notes and realize how badly they were cheated. So he kept them on the boat the whole time and whenever he, either he said, oh well we have to catch the wind, uh, and of course that's the way you, you go uh, up the Nile with the wind behind you, and uh, so that was right. But he, he'd, he'd stretch everything to suit his, his ends. And if, if a, another boat hove into view, they would say, oh, well, should we not exchange cards and see meet those people on the other boats? Um, he would say, oh, no, no, I've heard that those people on that boat have terrible reputations. They're terrible, licentious people, and I wouldn't have your reputations damaged. So he kept them um, confined as, as surely as if they had been in a harem on this boat. And this was a sad irony, because I think, really, this is reading into their story a little bit, but I think uh, part of the reason they wanted to go down the Nile, they, they weren't at all snobby, but, you know, by the time, by this time, we're talking about the 1860s, more people had traveled in Europe, but traveling in the East was distinctly exotic and quite expensive. So you had to be fairly exclusive to do it. Uh, it was quite romantic. And there would be at any one time maybe as many as 170, 180 of such boats on the Nile. And uh, the social life was apparently quite good. Indeed, Murray's guidebook to the Nile recommended as having a small pistol, not for defense, but for firing off. Because 
a dinner gong could not be heard on the Nile. So if you had invited guests on nearby boats to dinner, a, a thoughtful Nilotic host would fire a pistol to tell them when to get dressed, you know, in their presumably dinner jackets, and, uh, and then fire another pistol when it's time to be rowed over by your servants to the boat. So they got this pistol for firing off, but uh, firing off was not going to be their lot. It wasn't really till they got to Aswan that they finally managed to break through the barrier and go to a, a Presbyterian service of worship and discover how badly they'd been cheated. But they learned a very good lesson from this. Um, they had a travel maxim, which they had before they went, which sadly they hadn't quite implemented, which is never go to a country where you do not speak the language. And if they needed proof perfect of the validity of this maxim, then this Nile trip was it because they spoke all the other languages. They spoke French, German, Italian. They'd managed perfectly well until they got to Egypt, and they didn't speak Arabic. But they were going to learn Arabic for the next trip that they made. So I this game blanking out here. Now, um, what happened then? They went back, and it's interesting. They, they moved almost immediately to London. Uh, the, uh, Grace was still living in London. And this, again, was strangely, they were fiercely patriotic Scots. Uh, but, you know, they were really trapped in this tiny village. They didn't know anyone else. They didn't have anyone to introduce them to anyone else. And this, the London they moved to was distinctly expat Scots. They went to the Presbyterian church, they helped in the soup kitchen, they did all these things. So they were moving in Scottish circles. And within a year of their moving there, Agnes had written a book about their trip, and um, uh, Margaret had fallen in love. Um, Agnes's book was uh, pretty well received in, in modest circles, as a, especially the, the account of the way they'd been so badly cheated. It was an unusual travel story. Uh, and, and Margaret had fallen in love with um, a Presbyterian clergyman some 20 years their senior, called James Gibson. And um, James Gibson was, um, uh, had also gone out to Egypt and had traveled as far as Petra. He'd gone to Sinai, and here you see him. Um, he, he, however, somehow in his 30s, he became, he was always very worried about his health. He'd been a delicate child. And um, in his 30s, when his father died, and uh, I, my father was a glass uh, a grain merchant in Edinburgh, left him uh, enough money to live on, he resigned his Presbyterian ministership and he devoted himself really to his own health, or as he perceived his lack of health, going from spa to spa and wondering when he would die. Um, well, I paint a rather grim picture of him because he, he was a bit morose. I, I suppose you might say he was a bit depressive, but like many people who are subject to depression, he was very witty and charming with it and when he wasn't depressed. And he was, he was quite learned. He developed an independent interest in uh, 16th century Spanish writing and uh, Spanish letters. And he uh, fascinated the twins with his, his interest in literature and so on. And here is the, um, well, I need to go back a little bit. Um, he and Margaret, as I said, they, they met uh, very shortly after um, the twins moved to London. But they had, he and Margaret had this courtship, on-off courtship, for 12 years. When he was always, he would be proposing and then sort of withdrawing his proposal because he was, he said, oh my dear, you're so young and beautiful and I'm soon going to die. It was that kind of thing. And, uh, but Agnes and Margaret weren't about to be held back and they decided to make another trip, this time um, to Greece. Uh, and they had done smaller trips, but they decided to go to Greece and they had kept up with their languages while in London, and they had acquired um, uh, ancient Greek and Hebrew, and they'd started on, or Agnes had started on, uh, on Arabic. Um, but one of the things they did that was very unusual is they learned modern Greek. Now, they did this because they met a professor of classics from Edinburgh called James Blackie, who believed that the best guide to the way ancient Greek was spoken, because no one knew, was the way modern Athenians spoke Greek today. This turns out to be completely untrue philologically, but it was a useful falsehood for Agnes and Margaret because they learned to speak modern Greek. Now, your educated Englishman in those days might have had eight or nine years of Greek and could read Greek very well, but to communicate with Greek, that's out of the question, because his pronunciation would be Erasmian. But these two ladies spoke Greek. They decided to go to Greece and to travel around Athens and so on, but to travel on horseback through the Peloponnese. And Agnes obviously wanted to write another book of the sort that she had written, uh, that had garnered some 
uh, fame. In the meantime, I should say, she had, had tried her hand at writing novels, which were all sort of sub-George Eliot, where they sort of, um, they, they all had, their heroines were all fearless Presbyterian young women of, of, of deep piety who, you know, who are, who are blighted, in, in, blighted in their love lives through pride of blood. You know, they were a little bit, a little bit um, autobiographical, one can't help but think. But anyway, they were terrible as novels. I, I read, each one was 900 pages long and I read three of them. That was, I can't really recommend them to you, but there's only one copy of each left in the world, so you're unlikely to fall upon it. But uh, uh, anyway, they decided to go to Greece and um, uh, we're going around, and I think Gibson was just terrified at the fact that his beloved had got out of his sight. He was sending Margaret these plaintive telegrams um, uh, all, as they traveled around Greece. And as soon as they got back, in fact, before they got back, when they were still in Germany, he traveled up to meet them, which is a great bold step for him, and uh, they were married. Um, this is the photograph they sent out to their friends to announce their marriage. Um, you can't really see it very well, but her, her wedding ring is quite prominently on display. He was a great chess player. And you can see that she's wearing quite a fashionable dress. They bought their, they, although they were Presbyterians, they bought their frocks from Paris Couturiers, and they didn't believe in leaving entirely simple life. And uh, there, I think this is checkmate. I think that's the most sexual display in my, uh, <laughs> my whole display. <laughs> okay, so, so this was a great time. The, um, the, the, the Gibsons, the, first, the only time really the twins were separated, I think, almost in their lives, was the six months of the uh, uh, Gibsons' honeymoon, and they went away and traveled, and uh, Agnes stayed back in London and hired a private Arabic tutor and worked on her Arabic. Then when they, um, the married couple came back, they took a large house in Surrey. Uh, they were always keen horsewomen, and uh, they had a great time there. They published all three of them. Gibson enjoyed a, a rallying and a new lease of life, and he um, taught, I think, Margaret how to edit uh, the, uh, the Cervantes that he was working on. So it was a wonderful, wonderful time um, for, for them all. But unfortunately, it was not to last, and uh, three years after Margaret and uh, James Gibson were married, unexpectedly, um, he, he died. I mean, this was he'd been expecting to die all his life, but when he did die, he hadn't been expecting it. And it's a bit sad, because even... Agnes wrote in her memoir of him, um, which she didn't seem to write as humorous, but it was, incidentally. She said, he sent me out that very morning to buy him long underwear, very much in the spirit of a man who intended to wear them. So, um, <laughs> so obviously death caught him unawares. And Margaret was devastated, you can imagine, after 12, 14 years of courtship, Finally married, they had a wonderful, loving marriage, and then this wonderful man is gone. And she must have been very desolate, because Agnes said, you know, in those days, I didn't even want to leave Margaret alone. So they decided another trip was in order, but Margaret was delicate, so they decided to go just as far as Cambridge and spend a month in Cambridge uh, visiting the ancient courts and the wonderful libraries. And on the last day of their visit there, they visited Corpus Christi a Library, and um, Agnes got in a big discussion, you might say, almost a fight, with the librarian, Samuel Lewis, over the correct pronunciation of ancient Greek. <laughs> and uh, in, in nine months, they were married. So um, Samuel Gibson, I should say librarian, you know, I don't almost have to say in this building, um, with Monica here, uh, that uh, librarians come in all shapes and sizes, but he was the keeper of the Parker Library of Corpus Christi College. Parker Library is one of the most valuable collections of ancient, of um, English manuscripts in the world. It was collected by Archbishop Parker, who was one of the very first Archbishops of Canterbury um, after uh, the you know, Henry VIII, uh, and he was able to go around at the time of the dissolution of the monasteries and basically take what he, he likes. I always understood that the, the, um, the phrase nosy Parker, I don't know if that's an idiom in American English, is it? Mm -hmm. Well, I thought that came from him, but I think that may be an urban myth, so mm -hmm. I don't know. But anyway, he go, went around in the great tradition of sort of 
uh, lifters of manuscripts, <laughs> for whom we are subsequently very grateful, and took these things. So they have fantastic things. The, the Bible that St. Augustine, not Augustine of Hippo, but the Augustine who evangelized the English, brought with him the New Testament, that New Testament, the New Testament on which Anglican, the Archbishop of Canterbury, is installed, that's in the Parker Library. The, um, the, the first draft of the 39 articles of the Anglican Church, those are in that Parker Library. So I think 70% of the Anglican, Anglo-Saxon manuscripts in the world are in the Parker Library. So he's a keeper. He, when I say librarian, he wasn't stamping books and due dates. Uh, and so he was a substantial scholar of manuscripts and ancient books. And um, so he was also a great collector of things. He, was a, he taught Greek, and he was a collector of antique coins and carved gemstone rings and pots. And he was one of these uh, academics that, you know, in those days, only very recently had Cambridge academics been allowed to get married. Most of them were bachelors. And he, he um, was one of those bachelor dons who, as soon as the academic term was over, he'd be across the channel on a steamer and then be found a week later in Constantinople bartering for coins and so on. So he was a fascinating match. For Agnes, they even had friends all over the world in common, and they um, set up a glorious life together. Um, they built a, a lovely house for themselves um, in, uh, in Cambridge called Castle Bray. They planted pine trees behind it to remind them of Scotland. And it was planned basically for scholarship and conviviality. All three of them, Margaret lived with them, had studies, and the whole ground floor could be opened up so they could have big parties. And uh, uh, Lewis was... Um, endlessly gregarious, he used to bring people home unannounced all the time, wonderful exotic peoples and, and foreign travelers, ambassadors. And I think that Agnes and Margaret thought they at last had the life that they, they always longed for. It was so interesting and perfect for them. And indeed, Agnes traveled quite a lot with Samuel, as far away as Morocco, they you know, go quite uh, far afield traveling. But as you may have guessed, this was not to last either, and after the same residual three years, um, uh, Agnes and Samuel were, were in, in uh, Oxford on a visit, and he, um, oops, he ran to, she, she had been, he placed her in a carriage and then remembered he wanted to give a note to someone, and dashing back to the carriage, uh, he forgot you had to climb up the stairs to go over the platform, and he, he came into the carriage uh, sat down, commented on the Arabic newspaper she was reading, and uh, heart attack, and he was dead. So um, this was a terrific sadness, because you might say to lose, to find one husband late in life and lose him would be sad, but for the twins to have found two marvelous husbands and to lose them both in quick succession was a, sh a great tragedy. They loved their husbands, but it was not just that. In those days, really, a man was the entree to the, the intellectual world for you. Without a man, you were quite generally restricted to the world of women. And in those days, uh, even in, in Cambridge, who were just beginning to get women college, very few women were um, uh, very highly educated or wanted to talk in, uh, in the way that Agnes Mar uh, Margaret wanted to talk. And so they were uh, obviously um, very sad, but they decided their sovereign cure for, for sadness was to make a journey, and they decided to uh, go to Mount Sinai and the burning bush. So this is, of course, a contemporary shot, just taken with a cheap camera. Uh, so if you have long to go for Sinai, to Sinai, don't delay. This is what you will see and be able to take a photograph yourself, even with a cheap camera, this wonderful, strange landscape of, of rocks, volcanic rocks that have been carved by wind-blown sand, uh, extremely beautiful. Now, Agnes and Margaret wanted to go. The symbol of the Presbyterian Church was the burning bush. Of course, the Moses stories, the stuff that Moses, Potiphar, Joseph, all these stories, the biblical stories, had completely formed their uh, biblic biblically based childhood. Uh, but of course, also, uh, St. Catherine's was famous as the monastery in which the world's oldest Bible had been found, the Codex Sinaiticus, had been found there in the 1840s by a German called Constantin von Tischendorf. And this was uh, truly astonishing. As many of you in this room will know, um, but it came as a surprise uh, to me when researching this book that the, the manuscripts on which, for instance, the King James Bible and most early modern Bibles were based um, 
basically based on the Greek text put together by Erasmus. They were, they were not based on manuscripts that were very old. I think the oldest manuscripts that uh, Erasmus had at had his disposal were only about 12th century. And no one really knew how old the Gospels were. When were the Gospels written? What was the oldest copy of them? And of course, at, in the 19th century, you began to get more skepticism, particularly in Germany, not just skeptics from the critics of religion, people like Thomas Paine, who was arguing that the Bible was written many, many decades and centuries after the life of the apostles. apostles. But you began to get scholars like the Bauer School in Tübingen um, that said, oh, yes, the Gospels, especially John, must have been written, you know, several centuries after the events of uh, New Testament times. And this was very traumatizing, especially to people like Scottish Presbyterians who were brought up with very strong ideas of the fidelity of Scripture. So um, Tischendorf uh, went out um, intentionally to try to find um, old manuscripts of the Bible. And after, as a young man in his 20s, going through, he was a very great discerner, very great paleographer, a student of ancient hands, and he went to Paris and, and deciphered a very difficult manuscript. And he managed he, to figure out that the oldest manuscripts he was finding were the products of Eastern scriptoria. And he thought that maybe some of these great monasteries of the East in Egypt might um, have wonderful manuscripts. And there at um, uh, Mount Sinai at St. Catherine's Monastery, he found this very ancient manuscript, still with the Vaticanus, the most ancient um, uh, copy of the Bible that we have, and, and indeed probably the, the oldest book in the world. Some of you may know that the Codex Sinaiticus has just been published for the first time, just in July. It's been published online. Um, the reason it's the first time is that fragments are, are, are in four different places, and it, so it's first come together online, and uh, uh, it's a very spectacular achievement. So Tischendorf had made St. Catherine's famous, um, uh, but most people thought Tischendorf had discovered everything worth finding at St. Catherine's, that he was such a brilliant paleographer. However, Agnes and Margaret, when they were doing the preparation, still in Cambridge and doing the preparation for their, for their travels, they had um, uh, read, Agnes had read an account by a Quaker scholar called Rendell Harris, who had recently discovered a, a, a famous lost manuscript at St. Catharines in Syriac. And he reckoned there were manuscripts in Syriac that still had not been, been examined. Uh, he, he discovered um, um, a book that was known about because it was mentioned by um, Eusebius, an early historian of the church, uh, called the Apology of Aristides, but you know, just because so, uh, something is mentioned by an early someone as early as Eusebius doesn't mean it really existed. But that is what Randall Harris discovered, and um, Agnes and Margaret befriend, befriended Randall Harris, and he encouraged them, and he um, Agnes because of this started learning Syriac, and in the nine months between her husband's death and their going to Sinai, she learned Syriac. Um, she said it wasn't so difficult if you already knew Hebrew and Arabic. I, I leave it to those of you in here who know Syriac, to, even to discern the script, which I can't, uh, seemed to be quite an accomplishment. But she learned Syriac. Randall Harris taught them how to use a camera. He, he persuaded them they had to bring a kind of a, a stand because if they were going to find anything, they need a stand to hold things. And most importantly, he told them about a dark room, a dark closet off a dark room underneath the archbishop's um, lodgings where he thought there were manuscripts that hadn't been examined. And Agnes said in the, in the nights before they went, she dreamt of this dark room. Well, there you see St. Catherine's as it looks today, uh, uh, very much as it looked <laughs> in the time of Justinian who built it. There was, it's the oldest inhabited, continuously inhabited monastery in the world. And, um, there is a, 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 a Nicole Biblik photograph of it, um, a little bit closer up. You see the garden there, and um, the, the uh, church is a bit, perhaps a bit more discernible. The basilica with the lead roof, do you see it there, is uh, oddly positioned because it's uh, at, in front of the, 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 the window here. The, the, you see the church with the lead roof going back, and that is um, on the site of the burning bush, ostensibly. and. Uh, there, you see slightly different angle. Yes, there's a better view. You can see the church 
church tower, and beside the, behind the church tower is a mosque. There's been from the 11th and 12th century a mosque as a kind of insurance policy inside the, the, the walls of the monastery. And of course the monks, as you probably know, work very closely with the, with the Bedouin, um, uh, uh, the local Bedouin tribe, who initially were Christians. They came out, uh, Justinian had the monastery built in the 6th century, and he had had people come out from Alexander to help the monks build the monastery and uh, to work as servants for the monks. And in due course, those people have become Bedouin and become Muslims. It's a very interesting story in itself. And uh, there's a picture taken by Agnes and Margaret. Um, that shows you the, the, the wall. In, in the um, er, days of Antishendorf, as in most Eastern monasteries, you had to be hoisted up through that hoist house over the wall, you, there was no gate. By the time Agnes and Margaret arrived there, there was a gate. Um, of course, people said they set out and, and to, to go to Sinai. You know, again, you had to go sail to, to, to Alexandria, then get to Cairo, and Cairo you had to hire a dragoman. The dragoman had to hire Bedouin, traveler, uh, Bedouin um, guides and camel drivers and camels because you had to have special camels and guides for the Sinai. And then it was seven, eight, nine days trip across the desert. And it was dangerous. I mean, many people died. Even a small cut could get infected. You could die or lose your sight. And, and it certainly uh, wasn't for the faint-hearted. And of course, many people said to them in Cambridge that they wouldn't even be admitted to the monastery because um, uh, Orthodox monks are not famously hospitable to women. But Agnes and Margaret had been welcomed in the Greek monasteries in Greece, and so they thought this would not be so. And Rendell Harris was encouraging and gave them a letter. And indeed, when they arrived, they were welcomed. The monks had been forewarned. The archbishop had been forewarned. They had a letter from Rendell Harris, who also spoke modern Greek, and, and uh, the monks trusted him. Many of the, the, the other travelers, Western travelers, who went didn't speak modern Greek, and so there was always a barrier of communication with the monks. And um, after pleasantries were exchanged, Agnes was asked what she would like to see, and she said, your oldest Syriac manuscripts, especially those Rendell Harris had not time pro properly to examine. Uh, so that's, uh, again, a photograph of the monks' quarters taken by Agnes and Margaret. That's the burning bush. It's as it is now. Well, apparently as it always has been. It's a trailing raspberry, and its roots go under this very ancient chapel, so it's a, an extremely old bush by any account. And I suppose when it flowers, like most wild raspberries, it must be red. But um, what charms me that they keep a fire extinguisher next to it. <laughs> so nothing bad is going to ever happen again there. Now, Agnes was shown down by torchlight to this dark room, dark closet of the dark room, and there were several chests. And from one of these chests, they took out eight or nine manuscripts to the light of day. And this, Agnes saw the one that, that Randall Harris had found the Apology of Aristides in, uh, or Aristides, I think I should properly say it. Um, and, uh, but her, her eye particularly fell on this very unpromising watch. All its uh, pages were, um, sort of glued together, and uh, she looked at it, and the, the upper writing she could read, it's in Syriac, and it, it was the lives of women saints. But she, looking at it more closely, she could see it was a palimpsest. That is, the, the vellum being very valuable, at some stage, the community had uh, taken a manuscript and recycled it. They had scrubbed out or scraped off with a, a, a knife the uh, writing on it until it was blank, and then they had um, they had written again on it a new text. And this apparently had happened to this these sheets of vellum because at the top of each page you could see according to Matthew, according to Luke. So the underwriting was the Gospels. Now she had great beginner's luck because she wasn't a scholar of ancient scripts, but the upper writing was dated to about the scribe of the upper writing. These lives of women saints. It wasn't, by the way, an original. It was a copy of well known tales. Um, uh, the upper writing had uh, been dated, I think, around 879. And she reckoned for this book, to, these sheets to have been palimpsested in that way, the underwriting, the gospel text, must be much older, pressing it back to the earliest known Syriac text. So you can see that although she's an amateur with no college education, she's 
pretty savvy, really, and, and uh, not, not by any means a tech scholar at this stage, um, just a lady traveler who's highly, highly educated. So she, she, at this stage, she was the only one. Margaret, her sister, did not know Syriac. The librarian, Father Galactian, who's rather grubby thumb, I think that is, um, he didn't know Syriac, and, and they had taken with them a thousand photographic negatives. And Margaret had to really fight with both Galactian and her sister to devote about 400 of those to photographing this palimpsest. Because photographing a palimpsest, who knows if the underwriting will even come through. And Agnes thought it might turn out to be just something completely worthless. Galactian wanted to show them beautiful, illuminated manuscripts that he thought were more interesting, because this was a scruffy old thing. Um, but no, they, she wanted to photograph this um, in a way that will make the text scholars amongst you uh, run cold, they steamed across, steamed the pages of it apart with a camp tea kettle and mm -hmm. photographed it. And then dashed back to Cambridge in uh, great haste to, after, to, to show the scholars back home. Well, of course, da dashing back to Cambridge took about two months. Um, and uh, here is a picture of the, of the manuscript as it is now. The, you, this is the upper writing you see. You can't even in this photograph see the lower writing. And the um, the monastic uh, church with these wonderful mosaics of, uh, of the Transfiguration, uh, which meant absolutely nothing to Agnes and Margaret, I have to say. There, the Pilgrim Way, if you hike up, the stairs are slightly better today, not too much. Um, and that's, as you see, if you climb up past the Garden of Elijah, you can see how without the, the oases, how bare it is, um, and uh, up. This is a view, this is a 19th century photographic library shot of the valley where the assembled peoples of Israel were meant to have gathered to receive the law. Uh, and there, again, you see, the, you see the, 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 the walls of the convent there, 15 to 20 meters tall. They look just tiny, dwarfed by these surroundings. Okay, next stage of the story. They dash back to Cambridge, and the most thing they want to do is to get recognition for this find and validation of that it really is as ancient as they think. And there, um, unfortunately, the summer holiday has begun and the academics are slipping away. Uh, Brendel Harris was able really to only look at one or two of their photographs. And the, the sort of great figures in Cambridge at the time were um, Professor Bensley, uh, who is the professor of Syriac, or who knew the most about Syriac, and his cadet, Francis Burkett, pictured here. It was a 33-year-old man, uh, the same age as this photograph. And uh, the, the Agnes and Margaret knew Burkett and Bensley. They'd actually, before, when they were renting a house, before they built their own house, they lived on the same street as Burkett and Bensley. But Burkett and Bensley, although around, would not look at Agnes Margaret's photograph. Agnes said, even when I tried to show Mr. Burkett the photographs in his own back garden, he wouldn't look. Now, why? I don't know. All I can think, really, projecting back, is that these two ladies were just middle-aged, just Scottish, just Presbyterian, just, you know, tra ladies who traveled. And the, the, uni the university professors, oh, these ladies are overexcited. They think they found something and so on. So, and in, in fact, Agnes and Margaret had to trick um, Burkett to coming to lunch. And they did this by asking his, his wife, Persis, who's a great beauty, um, asked Persis to come to lunch and said, of course, do bring Francis. <laughs> and there, they had a number of other people there, including Mary Kingsley, later famous as a traveler in Africa. And uh, they had arranged, Agnes Margaret had arranged out their best photographs on the grand piano um, and said, and now, Mr. Burkett, you'll surely want to see our photographs. Well, he had no choice. And he went and looked. And to give him credit, he did realize they were very important. He asked to borrow some to show to Bensley. And within 24 hours, he was back to them. Top secret, don't tell anyone. We've got to form an expedition to go. So I must um, hasten things up a bit. This expedition was formed. And Agnes and Margaret were not about to be left behind. And indeed, they were the ones who knew the monks and uh, had, the, had the entree. But of course, it was unseemly. Here's an irony. These two women had traveled all over by themselves without chaperones and with Arab guides, but it was unseemly for them to travel with Englishmen who weren't their husbands. So the um, resolution to this is Burkett and Brensley would bring their wives, and uh, Rendell Harris was also at the request of Agnes and Margaret brought along. And this party set out to travel. Um, uh, it turned out that uh, Persis Burkett as a child had lived in a Lebanese village and 
had at that time spoken, spoken Arabic. She thought she'd forgotten it all, but when she heard their camel drivers saying rude things about them yeah, <laughs> in Arabic, it all came flooding back and she <laughs> swore at them very roundly in Arabic, very crude Arabic, and they loved her after that. <laughs> um, so there were a lot of ironies involved in this trip. But sadly, there was a lot of falling out involved in the trip because it turned out once they got into the middle of the desert that Burkett and Bensley did not want Rendell Harris along with them. They thought Rendell Harris was an interloper. He was a paleographer too, but he was not a Syriac specialist, although he'd worked on Syriac texts. They didn't, they thought he was there to kind of scoop the pools, you know, that if they to, to be in on any new discoveries or perhaps steal some new discoveries. So there was very bitter wrongs, which are well documented. They were alluded to in the correspondence I had at my disposal, um, but there turned out to be a, a cache of letters from Rendell Harris to his wife written from Sinai um, uh, documenting this, which were absolutely fascinating in the Birmingham archives. Uh, um, but anyway, they went and they still, here they are, traveling away. Um, you can see, I think this is in the near, that, that's probably Persis Burkett nearest to us, Mrs. Bensley, who was in her early 60s and almost blind, very thick glasses, um, with a white band around her hat, and then uh, Agnes, Rendell Harris with a beard, and their dragoman, Ahmed, in the back. He's always smoking a cigarette in every photograph they have of him. Um, I think I have another one. There he is. <laughs> Characteristic. He basically had to run a five-star hotel for these Europeans going across. They go to Sinai, and, um, and they begin to transcribe. And here, it was very, very cold. Um, and this is January or February. And there you see a monk standing by to hold papers down to uh, provide ink and, uh, and so on. And Professor Bensley in Hamburg at this rickety little table. And then warmed up a bit here, you see Rendell Harris with Father Galactian, who was by this time um, the archbishop. Uh, and here, again, a warm weather shot. You see Galactian there. Uh, and in the background, um, Professor Burkett has swapped his Hamburg for a fez. And you see that there is... Uh, uh, Burkett looking very much the gentleman at leisure in uh, tweed plus fours uh, and, and the transcribing. So copying, 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 the three men madly copying this. At the same time, what were Agnes and Margaret doing? They had been asked by the monks to do um, um, catalogues of the Arabic and Syriac manuscripts uh, in possession of the li library. Now, um, there wasn't a catalog, and that meant that things could easily go missing or be stolen. And the monks had had a lot stolen. But uh, um, many people, many scholars had asked to do this, to make catalogues, but the monks didn't trust them. Why? Because if someone is cataloging your manuscripts, he's in the position to leave some item out and pocket it. But the monks trusted Agnes and Margaret, and they were doing this with the assistance of Randall Harris, who was helping them with things. But this caused another great explosion because, again, uh, Burkett and Bensley smelt a rat. They thought Randall Harris was trying to steal a march and find manuscripts. So it was all very difficult. And... Um, uh, kind of poisoned the water at their party. Nonetheless, they copied most of uh, most of the uh, doings. And this is a page of Agnes's uh, catalog. Uh, pardon me, we've moved on from it now. Yes, this is Agnes's catalog, um, Syriac into Greek, because of course the monks didn't read anything but Greek. So she did Syriac into Greek for them, and then Syriac into English for herself, and then Margaret um, Arabic into Greek. So pretty spectacular achievements. So. Moving quickly along, then you see here's Margaret sitting with a crew, their, their waiter with the fruit, their cook in the striped jacket, and various Bedouin women, and, um, and coming right along. Well, they went back to Cambridge, and things were difficult because the party had now fallen apart. Agnes had got the rights to publish, to, to be the editor of this publication of the, poem, the transcript for Cambridge University Press. But she wasn't at all sure that she'd have the cooperation of Burkett and Bensley. Uh, they hadn't signed contracts. And um, Bensley was not to sign a contract at all, because only three days after his getting back to Cambridge, um, he went to a college dinner where he ate oysters and drank stout, and he had a heart attack and died. So Cambridge is very clearly a very dangerous place for academics. And um, Mrs. Bensley was distraught and really blamed Agnes and Margaret somehow for the um, untimely death of her husband. And furthermore, um, there had been a, a real accident in breaking the news of the discovery of this manuscript. The letter which they'd all signed and sent from 
Cairo to announce this spectacular find had not made it to the Times. Instead, there was a leak that went through all the channels that leaked through that these two ladies, assisted by Rendell Harris, had made this spectacular find. So it was big news in the press, but big news that entirely left out the names of the two men who thought they were the most important in the party, Burkett and Bensley. And again, this just fed their um, justified paranoia that somehow Rendell Harris was trying to do them out. So it was a great deal of difficulty. Rendell Harris was completely uncooperative. He put Agnes in a position that she could either withdraw from having any involvement, basically, other than sort of just writing a sort of chatty introduction. Um, uh, or, or, or if she went forward, it would take more editorial responsibility. She risked looking like a fool because she wasn't a scholar. She shouldn't be in such a position as taking editorial responsibility for this. But she didn't give up. And her sister learned Syriac too. In the two years, those women acquired enough Syriac equivalent to doctorates. They published this thing. It was a great success. And they went on to be terrific scholars of Syriac and Arabic manuscripts. They edited two big series of Syriac and Arabic manuscripts for Cambridge University Press. They went six more times back to Mount Sinai. They were the first women to go into the Coptic monasteries in the Nile, from which your manuscripts are near, which your manuscripts have come from. And they, by the time, you know, uh, really, in the face of this pressure they were put in um, to fail, caused them to work so hard they succeeded and a new life opened up before them. Now, a final shot. This is not very good, but it's from their scrapbooks where in Birmingham they did in uh, uh, 1903 come and give some lectures in the States. And here you see this is from a Philadelphia paper, the Philadelphia North American Twin Sister Explorers Turn New Light on the Four Gospels. What I find charming about this is the newspaper artist's rendition of what it must have been like. You see a fashionable lady with riding gloves in her hand on the left talking to a cowboy in a Stetson. I think that's the dragoman. And then and the Orthodox monk is very much looks like a Catholic priest, doesn't he? It's a very uh, interesting uh, rendition. And um, finally, uh, this is the final shot I have of them. This is uh, with the niece of uh, one of their uh, husbands who was married out of their house, and um, Agnes and Margaret always were admirers of the latest technology. They never were in a plane, but surely if there had been flying machines, they would have wanted to go them. And uh, the, the acacia tree of Sinai, which was the model for the burning bush, uh, they're famous, and it was not consumed. Thank you very much. <laughs>